someone told me that the Lutherans are in the house. I heard it through the grapevine that Lutherans can have a good time. Oh, I heard it through the grapevine that Lutherans can have a good time. Are they right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so delighted to be with you here to be um, for your warm hospitality, for those that have made a way for me to be here with you, to be welcomed into the Lutheran family at least for one night. <laughs> and with a house band like that, I'll be a Lutheran anytime. Let's give it up for the house band. I'll be Lutheran tonight. I generally refer to myself as a Baptocostal, so something may break out tonight, if you know what I mean. I teach and preach at Duke University, and God has a sense of humor because I've been called to preach to devils, blue devils. Is anybody a Blue Devil fan? Are there any? Uh-oh. <laughs> That's the amen, amen corner, corner. okay. And it's, it's, it's cool and it's great that the Duke men's basketball team won the NCAA championship this past year. The brother in the back had a t-shirt on that said, love your haters, so we, we will love those who are Blue Devil fans. But, it's great that the team won the championship, but tonight there's even something more spectacular that I want to talk about with you briefly, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now, I know the passage for this conference is focused on Mark, Mark 16, and if you read that passage in your materials, you might begin to question, what kind of ending is this for Mark's gospel story? What was Mark thinking? Because I'm still looking for a real sermonic ending because Mark doesn't provide it. It has to be somewhere here in Ford Field because this can't be all that there is. There's no resurrection body. There's no reunion with the disciples. There's no commissioning of the disciples, no ascension, and actually in the Greek, Mark ends his gospel story with a word, a participle, the word for. Almost all scholars say that the, the gospel of Mark ends that way. Most of our Bibles contain, uh, contain two other endings, which were probably ended later or added later, centuries later, and so this is a strange way for Mark to end the story about the resurrection with a little word for. And I know Mark didn't learn that in one of my preaching classes. After all the time Mark takes to focus on the suffering and the death of Jesus, he closes with eight measly verses about the resurrection. Mark, this is not how you close a sermon. I'm still looking for a real sermonic ending. Where is the climactic celebration at the end in the face of the empty tomb? Where are the shouts of joy or even a rendition of President Obama's amazing grace or even that Lutheran amen? Mm. Mark could have given us at least three points and a end with a clever poem, but Brother Mark, Brother Mark, you can't grow your church like this. People won't be able to handle all the pain, all the agony you preach, because many just want a comfortable and cozy Christianity and a bloodless Christ and feel-good sermons. But Mark doesn't care. He just wants to tell the truth 
and nothing but the truth. And so his sermon ending is not happily ever after. It, 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 it's not happy a la Pharrell Williams like a room without a roof. No, because if we look at Mark's face tonight, and if we look closely, we might see his smiles out of place. And if we even look closely, we might trace the tracks of his tears because Mark isn't happy at all. We hear an Easter proclamation in that passage from the young man in the tomb. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's been raised. He's not here. But there's some lament underneath what Mark proclaims because Mark understands the blues inflected reality of life. He understands that there are people walking the streets of Detroit and saying like the poet Langston Hughes, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. He, he realizes the realities that we live in of war and famine and poverty and disease and racism and classism and sexism and homophobism and militarism. He knows and he understands that life sucks sometimes. And look at what happens because when women are told to go and tell the disciples and Peter, they don't sing like the Jackson Five. I'll be there, just call my name and I'll be there. No, they're not singing that. They're getting away from there. They are fleeing from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's how it ends. He ends his gospel story with the three women who were the first disciples to see the empty tomb, witnessing, but in silence because of fear. Mark closes this Easter sermon in an unorthodox manner with silent, fearful disciples. They weren't singing, Christ the Lord is risen today, alleluia. No, no, it was more like nobody knows the trouble I see. And they probably sang that too. But once again, what we have here, it seems as if disciples just don't get Jesus. The only thing that we sometimes get is how to specialize in a Christian culture of fear. And the only thing worse than a fearful disciple is a silent one. I know there are church folks who talk way too much. They have an answer for everything, proof texting scripture. I know we, we pray that some of the TV preachers, none are here tonight, would, who would be indeed silent as they ask for a seed offering of $19.95 in exchange for that prayer cloth dabbed in olive oil from Jerusalem. I know that silence as a spiritual practice can be constructive and a means of hearing God. But in Mark's sermon, fear leads to a silent witness of the gospel, and really no proclamation at all. Failed discipleship in the face of one of God's greatest miracles, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here we have a type of homiletical paralysis that causes your tongue to stick to your jaw. The cancer of fear as a disciple can swallow up your courage and soon can mute your voice because fear will silence you. And I know no one here became a Christian to be silenced. I know no one here became a Christian to fold your hands and just to sit quietly in your seat. I know no one here became a Christian to spend your life and all day long drinking your Starbucks caramel macchiato. I know some are afraid to talk about the resurrection in this postmodern, postcolonial, post-Christian world. Some are afraid to say what's really on their hearts and their minds because of fear that they won't be liked. 
or fear that they that someone will get angry or fear that someone's feelings will get hurt or fear that they will offend or fear that they will lose a friendship or fear of terrorism or fear of immigrants or fear of the other but all of that fear will swallow your soul but all of that fear will create a silent sermon and how can we be silent when the tomb is still empty? How can we be silent when we see what's happening all over our world? How can we be silent when airplanes can be crashed intentionally into the French Alps by a pilot? How can we be silent when Walter Scotts are shot in the back by cops in Charleston, South Carolina? How can we be silent when hate rotten someone's heart to such an extent that you can sit in a Bible study in an AME church for about an hour and then shoot all of those Christians in Charleston, South Carolina? How can we be silent when we use violence as a means to deter people from being violent. How can we be silent as disciples in the face of all of the bad and sad news, all of the kinds of death, even on the streets in Detroit? But I'm here tonight to say that we can't afford to be silent. But even if we are silent, that silence does not stop Jesus. In a novel called Silence by a Japanese author, Shusaku Endo, he tells a story about a, a priest, Father Rodriguez, who was going to 17th century Japan to support the local church efforts there and to check in on one of his mentors. This was during the so-called time of hidden Christians and persecution of Christians. They were practicing their faith underground. And the novel tells the, tr the details of the trials of the Christians and the increasing difficulties of Father Rodriguez. And the Japanese security officials would order suspected Christians to trample a carved image of Christ as a way to renounce their faith. And if they refused, they would be imprisoned and killed. Rodriguez and his mentor are eventually imprisoned and captured. And as the government tortures the other Christians, the, the priests are forced to watch, but they tell the priests that all they have to do is to renounce their faith to end the suffering of their fellow Christians. Rodriguez struggles with this, particularly wondering if it is self-centered and unmerciful to refuse to recant when doing so will end another suffering. And he's torn, and at the climactic moment when he hears the moans of those who are being tortured, and as they are remaining in the pit, he looks at the image of Christ. And at one point, as he's staring at the carved image of Christ, he's trying to decide the carved image of Christ breaks its silence when Christ screams out, trample, trample. I more than anyone know of the pain in your foot, trample. It was to be trampled on by men. Christ says that I was born into this world. It was to share human pain that I carried my cross. Rodriguez obeys, and the Christians are released. And Rodriguez struggled with the silence because he didn't want to renounce Christ. But then the carved image of Christ speaks up and says, trample me, revealing what Dr. King once said at Riverside Church in the 1960s. There comes a time when we have to break the silence. Jesus is always ahead of us, even in that carved image, always showing us the way forward, breaking the silence even through the breaking of his own body. The young man tells the women at the tomb to go and tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead to Galilee. And there you will see him, just as he told you. Jesus is always ahead of us. He doesn't need the women's approval to go ahead. He goes on without them to continue his ministry. In fact, he was gone before they were told he was gone. 
and he goes to Galilee. He's not sitting outside the empty tomb signing autographs and taking selfies. He's not by the tomb sitting at a table sipping a chai tea latte. He's on the loose. And he's on the move. He's on the road again, as Willie Nelson would say. He's been raised, and he's not here. Jesus goes ahead with his ministry no matter what. He's always ahead of us because even when they went to the tomb, you can read it, they saw the stone had already been rolled back. God is always ahead of us not waiting for us, always rolling back stones before we get there, preparing the way for us, threatening us with resurrection. We know we've heard here in Detroit at Motown that Papa was a rolling stone, but we serve a God who rolls back stones. And this Easter message is not in the mouth of a fearful, silent disciple. But ineffective discipleship will not prevent Jesus from fulfilling his word and completing his kingdom work on earth. Jesus goes ahead of us anyhow. Despite our fear, despite the silence, despite the misunderstanding, despite arguments about who is the greatest, despite the betrayal of Judas, despite the disciples falling asleep in the garden of Gethsemane, despite Peter's denial, Jesus goes ahead doing what he knows best to do in Galilee. He does ministry. He's not sitting at his church office desk surfing the web for his next best sermon on the mount, but he is actively working in the world going ahead of us. And ever since he rose from the grave, we've been trying to catch up with him. The resurrection means that Jesus will always be ahead of us on everything. He was in Detroit before we got to Detroit. And he's, and he's never stuck in the past because he's attuned to the ministry needs of the present. We may be caught up in unproductive cycles of bureaucracy in the church about theological issues and disagreements over social issues, but Jesus is not waiting for us to get it together. He knows that if he did that, the church would have died a long time ago and he would still be in the grave. But he's on a mission in Galilee. He's going ahead to continue to proclaim the good news of God. And you know what Jesus does when he goes ahead? He calls disciples. He exercises unclean spirits. He removes fevers. He cleanses lepers. He heals paralytics. He stops women from bleeding. He heals children. He feeds thousands of people and cures the deaf. The ministry of Jesus goes on with or without us. And tonight he's going ahead of us. And he always goes ahead because he's our leader and Lord. We follow him, and it's not the other way around. It can be dangerous if we take charge. Mae Jemison once told a, a story about a cowboy and a horse named Speedy. A cowboy was trying to find a fast horse. And he needed to find the fastest horse that he could because he needed to get from the East Coast to the West Coast immediately. And so he went all over town trying to find this horse. And he finally heard about this horse named Speedy. And he went directly to the farmer and he said, I understand you have the fastest horse in town. And the farmer said, yep, that's right. And not only that, he's the fastest horse on the East Coast. Cowboy said, okay, I don't need to hear anymore. Just give them to me. Let me give you some money. The farmer said, hold on. I can't sell you Speedy until I give you some instructions first. And so the cowboy said, I don't need any instructions. I grew up with horses all my life. And the farmer said, well, then you can't have Speedy until I give you instructions. Well, all right, what are they? The first one that the farmer told him, he said, Speedy, will not go until you say, praise the Lord. And the cowboy said, fine, that's fine. And he started counting his, his money out for the farmer. And, and he said, uh, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. There's more instructions. What are they? Speedy will not stop 
unless you say amen. And, and all right then, are, are there any more? And the farmer said, no, that's it, that's it. So the cowboy counted out his money and he jumped on Speedy and he said, giddy up, let's go. And Speedy didn't go anywhere. And the cowboy kicked Speedy in the side and he said, giddy up. And Speedy just sat there. Finally, the cowboy remembered, and he said, praise the Lord, and Speedy shot out like a bullet. Speedy was boogity, 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 and Speedy was going so fast, he ran over the Appalachian Mountains, and the cowboy's ears popped boogity, 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 boogity. He, he tore up the Indiana cornfields, and he jumped over the Mississippi River through the St. Louis Arch, and Speedy was gone, boogity, 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 and he jumped over the Grand Canyon and he tore up the Great Salt Lake, not necessarily in that order, and he came up and over the Sierra Nevada mountains, and he looked at Lake Tahoe, and Cowboy looked out and saw the Pacific Ocean shining clearly, and Speedy was still going boogity, 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 and they claim up to a cliff. But Speedy was not stopping. The cowboy started getting nervous, and he started to say, whoa, Speedy, slow down. And Speedy was still going, boogity, 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 boogity. And they were almost at the cliff, and the cowboy was pulling on those reins, and Speedy wouldn't stop, and they were at the cliff. And then the cowboy remembered, and he said, amen. And Speedy stopped on a dime right at the edge of the cliff with his hooves barely holding on. The cowboy, you know, was real happy because he had made it from the East Coast to the West Coast in two hours. He was so happy, in fact, that he reared back, grinning ear to ear, and he said, praise the Lord. You see what can happen if we take charge? Jesus says, follow me as he goes ahead, and we can't stop him even if we wanted to because we don't hold the reins. Jesus is out of the tomb, and he's on the loose. He's alive, and he's calling us to where the ministry action is in Galilee, Michigan. And Mark's sermon is not finished. It's open-ended. The ending, in fact, is not the end, but there's an ending, all right. The ending is performance, a call for us to respond, to proclaim, to speak into the void and silence, to continue Mark's sermon with our public witness, to experience historical insomnia in which we are made restless by the empty tomb because we are threatened with resurrection. Because as Guatemalan poet Julia Esquivel proclaims, there's something here within us which doesn't let us sleep, which doesn't let us rest, which doesn't stop pounding deep inside in the very pupil of our eyes, which during sleep, though closed, keep watch with each contraction of the heart in every awakening to dream awake, to keep watch asleep, to live while dying, and to already know oneself resurrected. Mark's ending is our beginning as resurrection revolutionaries. I don't have to look for a real sermonic ending anymore because I'm looking at Mark's ending tonight when I look at you. But the question is, the question is, how will you finish the sermon? Because Jesus is looking for resurrection revolutionaries in Detroit, people who will rise up with him. Is there anybody here who wants to rise up? We've heard it said that if you want to go fast, go alone. But I want to say if you want to go farther, you have to go together. And there's a story about a, a very famous entertainer from the 20th century who's now deceased named Jimmy Durante. And he was asked by a director to come and perform for World uh, War II veterans. And he told the director that he didn't have a lot of time and he could only 
come to do one monologue, short monologue, and then come off the stage. So he flew into town for this performance. And he went out on stage and he did his monologue, but something strange continued to happen. People kept clapping and he kept, Jimmy kept talking and it went five minutes and then 10 minutes and then 20 minutes and then 30 minutes. And the show's director was wondering what was going on. And so Jimmy finally ended his, his monologues. He came to the backstage and the director asked him in the back, said, why, why did you stay out there? And he pulled back the curtain and he pointed, showed the director the front row, because in the front row you had two veterans who both had lost arms from war. One had lost a right arm and another had lost a left arm, but together they were able to clap. <laughs> you see, together you will be able to rise up as the body of Christ because you can't do it alone. There are only three disciples in Mark's story, but here tonight we have 30,000 disciples. So, rise up together, resurrection revolutionaries, because when you rise, something dies. And when you rise up with Jesus, death will die, racism will die, sexism will die, classism will die, homophobism will die, militarism will die. And when you rise up together, you will be able to bear burdens. And when you rise up together, you will be able to build bridges this week. And when you rise up together, <laughs> you will be able to break some chains. And when you rise up together, <laughs> you will be able to bring some hope to Detroit. And when you rise with Jesus, you say yes to life, and you say yes to love, and you say yes to hope, but at the same time you say no to death, and you say no to hate, and you say no to despair, and then what do you do? You go over to the empty tomb, and then you look at hell, and you tell hell to go to hell. So, resurrection revolutionaries, resurrection revolutionaries, are you ready to do it together? Rise up!